On today's show, we'll be joined by weekly co-host Ali Khan Bijani to break down the Rockets Jazz game. Jay Sean Tate makes his long-anticipated return to the Houston Rockets lineup. We'll take a look at his presence on the offensive and defensive side of the ball, the impact that he had on the Rockets lineups and rotations in this game, and hopefully something that sticks moving forward. We'll also take a look at Alper and Shingun's night, Jalen Green and his 30-piece performance, as well as how the Rockets failed to com- contain Laurie Markkinen at all, letting him go off for 49 points in this game. We're going to break it all down for you coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as Rockets Watch. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Where for today, our question of the day, how did you feel about Jay Sean Tate's return to the Houston Rockets lineup? Let me know in the YouTube comments. Now, today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. Joining us now is your weekly co-host, the X's and O's man himself, Ali Khan Bajani, tea master Ali Khan Bajani, or coffee master. I don't know what he's got in that mug. Maybe he's just drinking straight vodka after that Rockets game. Look, (laughs) joining us to joining us to break down the Rockets latest game, the 131-114. Loss at home on the second night of a back-to-back to the Utah Jazz. Ali Khan, I thought this game was quite a bit more competitive than the final score would have you believe because the Jazz really uh-huh. did kind of take over there late in the fourth quarter, blew this lead wide open. The Rockets had a chance there, a few minutes left in the game, 117-107. You know, maybe, you know, if they don't make some of the mistakes that they did down the line, you know, we're talking about a dub instead of a loss. But... I think for me, the, the the first thing that I want to discuss from this game before we get into kind of the, the yeah. game flow and <laughs> the Rockets' inability to stop Laurie Markkinen, who scored 49 points in this game, <laughs> a career high. I'll say I called it in the first quarter. I said, I don't know what Laurie Markkinen's career high is, but he's going for his career, a new career high in this game, and that he did. Thankfully, the Rockets didn't let him drop 50. But Jay Sean Tate made his return to the Rockets lineup in this game, Ali Khan, and in this one, in his first game since October 30th, I believe, of earlier this season, he had 11 points in 19 minutes on 5 of 8 shooting from the floor, was 1 of 2 from 3-point land, had a couple rebounds, couple of assists, couple steals, no turnovers, and really just making his impact felt on both sides of the floor, offensively, defensively. And we also saw some interesting uh, impacts to the Rockets' rotation and to, to how they kind of decided to deploy certain lineups in this game with the return of Jay Shantate and, and his very unique skill set as a player. Jackson, are you down? Because I'm down, down, down. Bad for Jay Shantate, man. Um, that, was the, <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> that was awful. Um, so bad. So bad. For, for, for those who didn't get the reference, that's a Jay Sean reference. Jay Sean, obviously... Um, responsible for the song down very famous you could listen to it you probably know what it is but no on, on jay sean tate it's just first and foremost on the rotation i think we have an idea what the rotation is going to be jackson because garrison matthew only played around four minutes in that first half and i think of those minutes as connector minutes meaning that when you're trying to kind of stabilize the rotation back from how it started to it started for the game right so you technically have nine nine and a half guys if you include half of Garrison Matthews, you have your starters in Jabari Smith, KPJ, Jalen, Green, Eric Gordon, Alper, and Shingun, right? Then you got Kenyon Martin Jr., you got Usman Gruba, you got Tari Eason, and then you have Jay Sean Tate. You know what's interesting about that? I don't see any true point guard in any of those four names off the bench I listed. But that's because, and this is something, Jackson, that you and I talked about in the summer, right? When we brought up that Jay Sean Tate had been working on his passing. What do we say, Jay, uh, Jackson? We said Jay Sean 
has a legitimate shot to be that backup point guard for this team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because we did not trust Dacian. We did not trust Ty Ty. And based off our conversations, we thought that it's a legitimate possibility that Jay Sean Tate could be the backup point guard. And, well, you know what? It's looking like he's going to be that backup point guard for this team. He played both alongside Jay Sean, uh, Jalen Green and also Kevin Porter Jr. And there were instances where when neither of them are on the court, he played alongside Eric Gordon, and he was also helping one initiate some plays. Him and Eric Gordon kind of going back and forth for each other there. So that's a big takeaway for me. And why is that important? Because it allows you to have some more stability, I think, off the bench with your goon squad lineup. It also allows you, and something I noticed it did today, is stagger Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green. I would like to see more of that. Maybe having Jay Sean Tate as a connector, having him at the middle of the the middle of the floor, that, that kind of top of the key area, moving the ball side to side. If something's not moving and Jay Sean's like, give me the ball, give me the ball, so he can move it to the opposite side, some of these young guys will listen because he is the leader of this team. And so I saw possessions like that where I was very pleased, you know, where the Rockets did move the ball side to side and play like the Jazz do right now. Where if there's something working, there's not a mismatch for Laurie Market on one side. Let me pass it all the way to the corner on the opposite side where Rudy Gay can knock down the three, right? The Rockets are very guilty of this, Jackson. And, and Jay Sean taking hopefully help them fix that where they kind of fixate on one specific thing on the floor where Jalen's like, you know what? I want to go one-on-one. Or when Al P's like, I'm trying to go one-on-one. Or when Kevin Porter Jr. is like, I want to go on one-on-one. I think having Jay Sean back, especially when he's on the court, will allow them to be able to move side to side and be able to make some plays because, let's be honest, Maybe that could help them with the transition defense <laughs> with how hey, poor they've been playing. Dude, I mean, look, if they could just make some extra buckets, right, and not have to get out in transition, that'd be nice. Look, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jay Sean Tate, first off, I, I didn't I, – I take full responsibility for this. I didn't run a poll for Locked on Rockets player of the game after this one. I, I didn't, and that, that's on me, guys. I apologize. But after discussing it with Ali Khan, we've decided to anoint – Jay Sean Tate locked on Rockets player of the game for this one. It was just, it was so good to see him back out there, right? You just, so much of what he does doesn't actually show up in the box score, unfortunately. But he's that guy. He is a connector piece. He helps move the basketball offensively. He helps make sure guys are in the right spots offensively. There were so many moments in this game where you saw Jay Sean kind of pointing and motioning and basically saying, no, like move here, or, you know, realizing that there, you know, things were kind of stagnating and running to set a quick screen and then slipping and just kind of causing motion within the offense, right? Or having the ball in his hands and be able to yeah. create for a teammate. Those yeah. moments are so exciting. And then defensively, right? Seeing him take the challenge of trying to slow down guys. Obviously, Lori Markin has still had his way with, with whoever was guarding him in this game. He was just absolutely on one. 49 points, 15 of 27 shooting. Just absolutely ridiculous. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in segment two. But... You know, seeing him, you know, take that take that challenge defensively, doing things like boxing out bigger, stronger players, even if he's not the guy who actually gets the rebound at the end of the, you know, at the end of the possession, doing that dirty work to box out a bigger guy so that somebody else on the team can get the rebound and get the transition, get the break started. All these little things that he provides. He's and and this is the other biggest part for me, Alec is yeah. he's just he's a high IQ player. And I feel like this Rockets yeah. team is desperately missing guys who just have a good feel for the game and have a high basketball IQ. And it's not to say that some of these guys can't, you know, grow and develop and get and get better and, and gain a better understanding for the game. But I feel like that was very much on display in this game, especially as the Rockets were fighting and kind of mounting their way back into this game and, and you know, eventually taking a brief lead there late in the third quarter. You know, Jay Sean Tate felt like a very big part uh, of everything the Rockets were doing in this one. And Jackson, just a quick follow up before I kind of get into um, some, a point I want to make about Jay Sean. There's something you mentioned that I, I want to just get clar- clarified from you for our listeners. When you when you say low IQ, that some of these players are not there yet, you're not saying they're not smart players. You're saying they don't have the same feel for the game right now as Jay Sean. They can eventually get to that feel of the game. Correct. Correct. Yes. You're not. You're, yeah. Okay. I, I just want to make that important distinction because you know what, Jackson. I think sometimes people hear the, the term low IQ players and they think that we're saying that these players just aren't smart basketball players. We're not saying that. We're saying that, you know, Jay Sean, just, he, he's able to digest a defense because he's three years in. He's also just overall, that feel for the game allows you to make certain plays. The other players who don't have the same feel for the game cannot do at that certain point in time. I think that's what Jackson is saying. So I want to make that important distinction. Um, but I, I want to make, I want to bring it up another point about getting players in the right spot. I tweeted about this play earlier, 
Um, but and Jackson, you 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 helped me by putting the video out for it too. The Rockets ran Spain pick and roll where Jalen Green's at a back screen for Alper and Shingun's man, and Jay Sean was either going to pass to Alper and Shingun or he was going to pass to Jalen. Jalen was wide open, missed he missed a three, but because Shingun got good positioning, he fought for an offensive rebound and put back and got the end one. So why am, am I bringing that play up? Because after that play was done. Jay Shante went up to Alper and Shane Goon and told him, that's what I need you to do. And let me tell you why that was important. The way that lineup was working for the Jazz, they didn't have a true seven-footer. And what they do, or not true seven-footer, they didn't have a true rim protector. And what, what, what happens in those situations is teams like to collapse, right? They're like, you know what? We may not have a true rim protector. We're funneling towards like they had Rudy Gobert. But what we'll do is we'll collapse the pain. We'll play into our shell. So because how Al P was able to run straight and kind of slip and, 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 and create some pressure in the paint and fight for position. That allowed the defense to collapse, which then had Jay, uh, had Jalen wide open. And because his position was so good, he had the offensive rebound and put back. And Jay Sean was encouraging and telling him, hey, good job. That's what I need you to do against the defense. That's how they're playing us. You have to be able to do these things. Yes, Al P should have the ball. We've talked about this. He can create offense, right? But there are times, depending on how the defense is playing, where a rim run – a simple way just to get inside positioning and box out is a good way to be able to generate some easy offense, help your transition defense get set, and be able to do all these types of little things. And so I was very happy with that. I think Jay Sean Tate's leadership was sorely missed. And that's just one example of something we're going to see, hopefully, if he can stay healthy here on out. Yeah, his his leadership is is another one of those qualities of his that does not show up in the box score, but it's something that this young group of guys can can absolutely benefit from having. And and again, you know, he just played. He was on a minutes restriction. He was he was getting these brief little stints in the game, and then he was getting just absolutely winded because he's one of those guys that plays you know plays to exhaustion when he's on the court because he plays so hard every second that he's out there on the floor. So that'll be slowly, you know. The, the minutes will go up slowly over time, but it was great having him back out on the basketball court. He is your Locked on Rockets player of the game for this one. Coming up, do you want to talk about some of the defensive side of things in this game, the struggles to contain Lori Mark, and we'll talk about Alperin Shingun's big night. He had 14 rebounds, eight of them on the offensive glass. Jalen Green managing to drop 30 points, but the efficiency not quite great. Getting to the free throw line, though, all of that, as well as we'll also hear from Steven Silas a little bit later on in the show, his thoughts after this game. But first, today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates of available. Identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Ali Khan, even though this game, it felt like, you know, we 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 had a lot of good to say about Jay Sean Tate, his impact there in the first segment. I will say Jay Sean Tate's return uh, single-handedly eliminating the three-center rotation from existence is such a, such a sight to see, man. I never thought we would see this day this season. I thought we were going to get Bruno Fernando and... Usman Garuba and Alperin Shingun sharing all their minutes at the five spot for the remainder of the season. So no more lob threat that is gone. It looks like, I don't know. It's too early to tell, but it very much looks like, and th this will be the final point on, on Jay Sean Tate, I guess, before we talk about some of the other takeaways from this game, right? Jay Sean Tate gives them a little bit of, a little bit of everything, right? He's almost like a melting pot of skill sets, right? Where he gives you like the secondary creator ball handler, right? And that's what Ty Ty was giving them or Dacian Nix, right? So like he gives them that skill set, you know, maybe instead of playing Garrison Matthews, his usual amount of minutes, right? You know, you know, 10, 15 a game, whatever those spot minutes off the bench, you know, 
Steven Silas utilizes Garrison as kind of like that wing presence, right? That slightly bigger body, shooter on the perimeter, whatever. And then even Bruno to a lesser extent, right? Having that lob threat, having a different look offensively for the front court, having a different presence out there, a bit more physicality, whatever. Uh, it feels like you're able to get some of those skill sets, all those things kind of melted into Jay Sean Tate. And then you're able to run what Ryan Hollins dubbed the super goon squad lineup with Jay Sean Tate plus the OG trio of the goon squad, KJ Martin, Tari Eason, and Usman Garuba. And then you can have one of Jalen Green or Kevin Porter Jr. or Eric Gordon out there as the fifth player. And again, not to toot our own horns, but we talked about this lineup, right, a lot earlier in the offseason about the excitement behind what that lineup could do and what it would look like. Unfortunately, in this game, Ali Khan, that lineup didn't exactly find a way to slow down Laurie Markinen, who just, the Rockets had zero answer for this guy. 49 points, 15 of 27 shooting, 6 of 15 from three-point land, 13 of 13 at the charity stripe, despite Craig Ackerman's best efforts to play some stellar free throw defense. Markinen was perfect from the charity stripe. I mean, he was getting whatever he wanted against this Rockets defense. You know, there's a specific play I want to highlight, and it was... When he was when he was getting going that first quarter, and Jabari was on him, and Jab we, one thing I want Rockets fans to understand is, and, and something just to ponder, the Jazz are one of the best corners three point shooting teams. So if that's the case, they're going to run pick and roll with the big to try to get, generate some pressure, so you help and create an open three for them, right? The Rockets are notorious for what, Jackson? They're notorious for helping. Helping from the corners. Corner. <laughs> but here's the it. thing I want. I want uh, I'm want. i going to make two points here, Jackson. And I, I want your thoughts on this. First point is, I think Jabari is, is, is having some struggles. And what I mean by that is he's a good defender um, in spots. He's still learning how to become a great defender, which I don't expect him to be his first season. He has all the tools to make that happen, but he's still learning. He's understanding how the game is played. He needs to get a bigger body frame. I mean, his frame is not easy to add more muscle to his body. You know, that, that's going to take some time. We've talked about that. But I think sometimes he tries to do too much to make up for what he sees to be some weaknesses. So, for example, if P is the one or if Usman is the one defending the pick and roll, right, as the drop big, but that perimeter player, you know, gave up too easy of a position for the ball handler and they're behind the play and it's going to be hard for the big to make a decision. Jabari, but you know what? I'm going to make the read. I'm going to come jump. But sometimes I feel like he overhelps whenever he's in that weak side rim protector role when he's at when that low man in the corner, right? He's coming over. I think sometimes he overhelps, which leads to some open opportunities. And you'll see possessions where John Lucas, like the play, a specific play I'm referencing in that second half of the first quarter, where John Lucas looked at Jabari like, what are you doing? Why are you helping off of a guy who's shooting so well to start the game? And, and that's just something I want to point out about Jabari, that he's having that internal struggle. Second is, Jackson, do I need to go and have a conversation about how to read a low man? Or how, how, not how to read a low man. How, what, what a low man is supposed to read, man? Because it is getting downright frustrating to be able to watch some of these decisions. You know, right, that was, I just, just, I just, 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 just as an aside before we dive into the whole, like, you know, because the Rockets low man never knows where to be, how to rotate. Watching Jay Sean Tate make the correct rotations on defense was such a godsend this game because, like, you're watching and you're watching the rotate and, like, seeing him. And there were moments where he was even covering ground for another guy, like, in between two yes. defend, in between two guys. And you could tell that he's covering for another guy who's out of rotation. And you're just like, like, this is what we're dealing with. So it was just, God bless Jay Sean Tate, <laughs> because he's about, you know, the meme of like the Popeye's worker who's like just gassed, like on the bench, like, like hunched over, like just exhaust. That's going to be Jay Sean Tate after covering, you know, for Jalen and KPJ and, and Jabari and Shingun defensively. Like, oh, it's going to, anyways, I, I'm sorry. For, yeah. I, I, digress. I mean, like, like you're, you're not as a low man, you're reading your big, right? You're reading, what is your big going to do? But, you know, ultimately, in the Rockets defense that has two perimeter starting point guards who struggle mightily at the perimeter. And I'll be very frank with you that Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green are way too inconsistent at the perimeter when they're playing, um, going or when they're playing for screens and kind of navigating around screens. Sometimes they're gone awful. I mean, it's, it's just bad. 
No, they, they, just, they just they just die. They just die on screens. They get they get screened yeah, and, and, and then they're just out of the play. And you know what's frustrating for that, and I'm I'm trying to get back to the game here is that Jalen has the frame to be able to navigate, and KPJ has the skill set to stay in front. And it's just they're so inconsistent with it. I think that's the big reason why players like Alper and Shane and Usman Guruba struggle in those. Which ultimately, that can be another conversation about that and having Usman probably switch more than he does. But you know, back to the, the the low man argument, the conversation we're having. If you're a low man, your responsibility is not just to read your big, but it's also important to understand and read the 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 ball handler, the perimeter defender, the point of attack defender. Are they able to recover quickly? You have to make that read quickly. If they are not going to recover, then you know what? Help and stay there. Don't be in no man's lane where you're like fake helping and fake re- re- returning back that's not going to work right you're not you're not your defense is not that you know diverse yet in terms of specific layers you don't have layers in your defensive scheme to be able to do those things right now but a decision needs to be made you have to make that read are you going to help and commit or are you not because once the low man commits and it's up to the other high side the the the, the guy who's higher and towards the perimeter to be able to rotate down and be able to take on one or the two of the shooters, depending who gets the ball on the pass. So it's, it's just really frustrating for me to be able to watch this team um, make defensive rotations, especially against a team that does move side to side, like hint, hint, the Rockets said they wanted to do for three years now, move it to side to side. But, you know, anyways, I, I just wanted to be able to say that Jackson, I think it's really frustrating that every week I come on here with you and we have to always talk about the defensive rotations and the poor poor reads and you know i i recall the coaches talking about how they want to teach the fundamentals of how to play defense of these young guys and be able to learn how to close out you know i i think that's very important how to close out right um but i also think it's important for them to be able to make a good decision as a low man like what is your responsibility are you if you know that a team is going to shoot a lot of corner threes at a high percentage, should you not adjust your defensive game plan to take those away, right? At least make it harder for them. If they're going to – it's a mathematical game at that point too. If you know they're good at three-point shooting and the guy who's scored 15 points already is in the corner, you're not going to help off that corner, are you? You're going to be able to stay with him and allow your big to be able to make a decision. Well, I just you, think- you would hope that they wouldn't help off him, but lo and behold, here we are. And, yeah, I mean, the, the dude, the, the, jazz, the Jazz guards were just picking apart the Rockets' defense all night, unfortunately. That's that's why they, they leapt out to such a big lead. Mike Conley, 11 assists, zero turnovers. Jordan Clarkson had five dimes off the bench even Taylor Horton Tucker Tucker was making some solid passes like they were they were moving the ball well they were finding the open man they were getting the defense in rotation and we know what happens when the Rockets defense gets a rotation guys get lost and they give up open shots and that's that's what was happening routinely in this one it was 18 points for Lori Market in the first quarter then Malik Beasley off the bench had 14 points in the second quarter then Lori Markkinen came back in a big way in the second half to finish his you know insane run yeah. to almost a 50 piece it was uh defensively it was something in this game but let's change gears here Ali Khan let's coming up I want to talk about Alper and Shingun Jalen Green their you know individual performances in this game as well as we'll hear from coach Steven Silas after this one his thoughts from the post-game presser we're going to get there but first today's episode is brought to you by bet online BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis this season. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro football to college bowl season to basketball, NFL, you name it, they've got you covered over at BetOnline. They're always the fastest and easiest way for all of your sports betting info. Right now, you can head over to BetOnline to take a look at who the odds on title favorites are for this season in the NBA, the 2023 NBA championship odds. Right now, the Boston Celtics still leading the way at plus 375. The Bucks. Starting to slip a little bit behind them at plus 650. The Brooklyn Nets creeping up the the odds list at plus 675. And then the Golden State Warriors at plus 950. And then rounding out the top five, you have the LA Clippers at plus 1,000. So for all those odds and more, be sure to visit betonline.net to learn more about the trends and action available to you. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Ali Khan, I thought Al P had a 
kind of a strong game in this one. Maybe a bit of a mixed bag, some turnovers, some, you know, a, a lot of fouls here in this one. He had, he was whistled for five in this game. Although I, I feel like some, you know, Alpi does get kind of a bad whistle at times. Although I, I don't think, I don't think any of the fouls in this one were super questionable. There was maybe like one where he got whistled for the offensive foul on Kelly Olenek that I thought was kind of eh, so-so. But 20 points, 14 boards, eight of them on the offensive glass, seven of 14 shooting. He had three dimes, had a steal, had a block, including some really highlight-level plays. Like he completely schooled Walker Kessler at one point, just faked him out, had him going, and then faked him up into the air, got Walker Kessler flying, and then went up for the dunk. I thought he had a really, really strong game in this one, despite the, or, you know, considering the fact that he was going up against a really crafty big in Kelly Olenek, who, you know, was trying all the, all the old vet moves, right? Like pulling the chair out from under Al P, you know, reaching, you know, tipping, all, all doing all these little things to try and, you know, get him off his rhythm. And then also dealing with the size of Walker Kessler down low for the minutes that he was in the game. You know, just a stat about Al P. Al P. You know, he we talked about he had twenty plus points, ten plus boards. That's a sixth time, sixth time this season doing so. He only did one, he did that once his rookie season. So he's uh he's looking good, man. He he he's playing really well on that end. I I think the the key takeaway for me, not just about tonight, last few games, but especially the way he played against a, a shooting big, is that sometimes I feel I feel like Al P is still learning how to play drop. And what I mean by that is that there were moments tonight where Alpi was, you know, beyond, beyond the free throw line, right? You're more closer towards the basket by the restricted area. And when he's playing close in that little – between the free throw line and the restricted area, he gets beat because then he he he's making a decision that's a little too late. But whenever he's a little higher, I feel like that it's easier for him to be able to commit faster – which it makes it easier for the, the players behind him who are rotating to be able to make a decision. And when you're playing against an offense that is predicated on making a defense rotate, the rotations become easier when they're kind of telegraphed, right? If LP is higher, he's making that com- commitment earlier, which makes a rotation happen, which makes it an easier read, and the Rockets can make those rotations. So I think in those possessions, I was very happy to see LP doing that. I would like him to see him continue to do those moments that he did tonight in terms of defensively to be able to come in faster, play a little higher and see where it goes. Cause you and I talked about, we want him to play more on the perimeter, but if he's going to play drop, at least play a little bit higher so he can, um, you know, be able to do those things. And one thing I want to, I want to bring up. I'll be play 30 plus minutes tonight. I was just about That's to do it. If you if you weren't going to do it, I was going to say it too. Alper and Shingun got 32 minutes. Garuba got 16 minutes. What have I been saying for weeks on this podcast? For weeks yeah, about the five spot. I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence, Jackson, that a certain guy named Jay Sean Tate was also playing. And let me read you a quote by our boy, Jay Sean, or sorry, Alper and Shingun, about a guy by the name of Jay Sean Tate. He said, quote, I'm so happy. I'm so glad he's back because he's my best friend on the team. He's always helping the team. He's giving energy. He's the second captain of the team. So I'm glad he's back. Those hey, guys Houston play fans, really well. I am so happy. That Jay Sean Tate is back. Now, look. He's gonna play. Are you going to play it again, Jackson? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Lob threat. Um, Lob threat. Man, there we go. More, <laughs> the, listeners want that. Now, Jay Sean played most of his minutes alongside Alper and Shingu. Okay. And there's a reason why those guys had a po- uh, positive plus minus in that first half. And so I, I, I think it allows you to do certain things, especially defensively, the way Jay Sean, you talked about it, right? Last segment, Jay Sean knows how to be able to make those rotations. There were times where Al P was that help man, I mean, that low man, sorry, not even low man, he was that drop big, and Jay Sean was the one coming over on the nail, right? And stunting and helping, or he was at yeah. low man making a rotation, helping make it easier for Alper and Shingun to play defensively. Offensively, Al P could actually be in the post. He could establish position down low. He didn't have to be that connector that we talk about, quote unquote, connector at the top of the key, moving it from one side of the half court to the other. Guess who was doing that? Jay Sean Tate. And so I, I, I think that was a very big takeaway from today that when those two guys play together, there is a recipe for that lineup to be successful. Because th- those two are not good shooters. Jay Sean had some shots, didn't make it. Shots look, looks a little better, had more arc on it. 
but you don't want Alpi or Jayshon shooting the basketball, right? You want them to be able to help you move the ball. But there is a way for them to play together. If Jayshon can play and be that screener, which he was tonight for Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green, if he can be that screener, and if he can also be that connector, then Alpi can screen and roll and drill, dribble handoffs time and time, and Jayshon can cut. But more times than not, Alpi can establish an offense by establishing position down low. And that goes back to my point in that first segment where I was talking to you about how he wanted LP to be able to play, right? Do things that allow the team to be successful. And a vocal guy like Jay Shantae being there and having a good relationship with a lot of these young guys, which he does, is going to bode well for guys like Alper and Shingu. Elsewhere for the Houston Rockets, Jalen Green, his night in this one, the high point man for the Rockets, 30 points on just eight of 24 shooting, which, you know, looks really rough at first glance. But what was what I thought was encouraging about this Alley Con was first, this, you know, you, you break down his shot profile. So he was eight of 24 overall. He was four of 12 from beyond the three point line. So he was four of 12 inside the arc. And then he was 10 of 11 at the charity stripe. This is is the type of game that I'm kind of okay with Jalen having from time to time where look, he, you know, was shooting a little below what you'd like from three point land. He was kind of inefficient inside the three point arc, but he buoyed that by getting to the free throw line, right? And he was 10 of 11 at the charity stripe. That's what you like to see the aggressiveness from Jalen green driving, initiating contact, especially getting into the land of the trees, right? Against the Utah jazz defense, right? You've got, down down there, right? You've got Lori Markin and seven footer. You've got uh, Kelly Olynyk six eleven. You've got Walker Kessel, another legit seven foot big man. You've got really lengthy defenders out there like Ochai Baji and Taylor Taylor Horton Tucker, who are you know clogging these driving lanes and and digging and reaching and making it really difficult. And Jalen was just getting into the defense and just creating that contact and making things happen to where he could get to the free throw line. So. I was really encouraged by that part of his play because, right, he hits maybe one more three in this game or, you know, one or two more buckets inside the arc, and you're like, oh, okay, this is a really efficient, like, solid game for Jalen because he got to the free throw line so much and he wound yeah. up hitting, you know, a decent number of shots elsewhere. So I was I was really encouraged by his game aside from the early turnovers. If memory serves, I think he had all three of his turnovers in the first quarter alone and then didn't turn the yeah. ball over the rest of the way. So that and, is... And yeah. The process was good. The, the process was good for Jalen. He, and you talk about his free throws, he drew seven fouls by Jazz defenders. That's good. The, pro, the process, I mean, when I say good, it was good for most of the game where he wasn't trying to force. Those three turnovers happened in the first quarter, he was trying to force. But over the course, especially that second quarter when he played with Al P, he was allowing the ball to get to him, which is what I want to see from Jalen. We talked about that last week, right? The whole hierarchy process. When Jalen does things to help his teammates be successful, the ball finds him, and then he could be successful based off of that. He didn't make those open shots, but he was driving. He was creating pressure, and the best thing I think will help him get out of the slump is attacking in transition. When he was getting the rebound or when he's helping gang rebound, then he can get the ball first from the rebounder and push the ball up the court and get his offense going. I think by the time we talk next week, Jackson, Jalen's going to have a much better uh, um, a few game stretch that we can discuss. You know, I'm just going to rename the show to Locked on Jay Sean Tate because, you know, it was also really nice was watching Jay Sean Tate get a rebound and or just get the ball on an outlet and be able to push in transition because he's another guy who is, again, he's capable. Boy, he can dribble. pointing it out. There we Look go. Me, like pointing out Jay Sean. So, gu guiding traffic, all of that. Putting guys in the right spots. Point Jay Sean is here and hopefully it does the not go anywhere pointer. else. That's, that's what I call Jay Sean Tate, the disco <laughs> pointer. He points out. Where to go on offense in transition, disco pointer. Jay Shantae, okay. the disco pointer. Oh, my God. You're just full of – you're on one tonight. All right, last thing here. We, we've got a clip that we're going to play from Steven Silas post game really quick. His thoughts right after this Rockets-Jazz game. I'm always going to be positive. I'm, there's days where I'm uh, frustrated <laughs> and uh, frustrated with the losing and stuff, but – I'm, I'm always going to be positive with this group because they are, they deserve it, number one. Number two, I understand the ins and outs of being a, the head coach of a rebuilding team. And I understand that there's frustration in the locker room, in the coach's room, with the fans, everybody. I get that. But I'm going to be the one who's going to be positive. And, uh, and that rubs off on others and it rubs off on our locker room and it rubs off on our fans and it rubs off on a bunch of people. So 
um, yeah, that, that's my motivation. I'm, I'm a positive person. I'm always going to be positive. <laughs> and uh, this is going to be a, uh, a fun thing once we get it all together. It's hard right now, but we're going to get it. You know, Ali Khan, I, I, respect, I respect the hell out of Steven Silas for that answer, honestly. Steven Silas like, pushing P, bro. Pushing positivity. <laughs> oh, God, stop. <laughs> Look, I, you know, this, this hasn't been easy, right? Look, you, you just, you had a game where the Rockets were, were down 20 something in the first quarter last night, the other night, right, against the Pelicans, and Silas yeah. gets ejected. Everybody's talking about, you know, Silas on the hot seat. Yeah. Is he going to make it? When's he going to be fired? All that. I, hell, I was talking about it last episode, right? And for him yeah. to just come out and kind of acknowledge and be like, hey, like, I get it. Like, we're we're in a rough spot. What we're doing isn't easy. But for him to not only acknowledge but embrace and, and just kind of stick to his guns of, of who he is, right? He says, you know, I'm a positive guy, right? He's just – he is – Mr. Positivity for better or for worse. And I know that's going to rub a Mr. lot of Rockets fans. P. Mr. Push and P, Push and Positivity. Look, I know that's going to rub a lot of Rockets fans the wrong way because there's a lot of Rockets fans who are just flat out done with Steven Silas. They don't like his demeanor. They get upset when he's laughing things off, shrugging things off. But, you know, maybe that positivity is what this, this Rockets team needs, right? Maybe, maybe that positivity does, you know, embolden these players or empower them to make certain decisions, to feel a certain way, to, you know, reach the, reach their ceiling, reach their potential. There's been a lot of up and down in this rebuild. I, I respect Steven Silas for his answer. I don't know if that changes what I think about him being the go the coach moving forward, but I still, I do respect the answer. I, I, I do as well, and I, and I think it's important that he acknowledges the frustration that exists because when you're going through a rebuild, it's never fun. And I will be very honest with you, and I've been honest about this, you know, since we've been talking about it. We, I don't know, this question came up in the offseason. We talked about it, and I always bring it up. This team is not at all ready to compete. I think it's, yeah, I guess common sense, Ali Khan. Yeah, they're not ready to compete. But what I'm saying is that they're not a complete team. They don't have everything they need right now. They still need to get – key players they still need to establish a foundation of things they want to do they're probably playing not the right system that they need to be able to play in the future for their best players right now they're still having players grow in their bodies and kind of develop a frame it's going to take time and it's going to have a lot of frustration and sometimes you know what maybe a positive face can help you and guide you throughout those things but I think you know it's going to come down to Rafael Stone and this front office you know after the season you've had three years now where you're trying to establish a tone, a culture reset. I think three years is a good enough time to be able to, you know, reflect and understand, are you, are you doing the things that you wanted to do? You know, it's, it's like whenever, you know, I have a public health background, whenever you do an intervention or some sort of project, you come back and you evaluate it. Right. I think it's, this is a good milestone three years to sit back and evaluate are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And then if the answer is no, from a culture perspective or from a roster perspective, what are you as a front office going to do about it, right? And so, so that's my takeaway from this. I think Steven Silas is a coach. That's somebody who's teaching these young men how to be able to be NBA basketball players. And he has a proven track record of doing that in terms of helping them be, you know, going from rookie first year, second year into blossoming into stars as these young players have the talent to do, be able to do one day. I think that's the right attitude to have. But it's also going to come down to can this team put together a culture and an identity and a, a foundation from a roster construction standpoint to be able to have these things come to fruition. And I'm looking at Rafael Stone in this front office to see, you know, Steven Stiles is coming out and saying these things as the face and acknowledging these things. Are you going to acknowledge the frustration that, the, that Steven Stiles acknowledges the fans have, that the players have, the coaches have? And, and be able to kind of reflect and do something about it moving forward. That's going to do it for today's episode. Alicon, you know the drill. You got to let everyone know where to track you down at. You can follow me on Twitter, Rockets underscore Insider. Follow me on TikTok at Rockets underscore Insider. Um, you guys have been seeing those film studies. I'll have one uh, from this um, last uh, back-to-back -back, um, coming up soon.
That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts on Jay Sean Tate's return to the Houston Rockets lineup. I read each and every one of those comments every single day. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets. Rockets basketball.